Hey, welcome back. This is another episode of my archive series. First one was very well received, so I decided to continue on with them. And as I'm doing a lot of projects at the moment that I cannot show in video, I dig out old footage. And I'm also working on the scraping video series, so um, that might come in the near future too. But enough of the talking, let's go and see some old footage. So, first thing is, I had PVC parts, this is a recurring job, that needed a step mill along their entire length. And I do that by clamping them in the vise and I have a long parallel backing them from behind. So. When I climb mill the, the step, the end mill pushes the part against the parallel and everything stays stable and nothing does vibrate. This is way faster than trying to clamp the part on the machine table and mill the step from above. I do climb mill for roughing and then I do just a spring pass in conventional milling to get rid of all the um, chips that still are sticking to the PVC. PVC isn't that uh, regard slightly annoying. Even with a super short vent mill, um, the chips tend to stick onto the work. Here I'm flipping part around, clamp it down and cut the second side. And here you can see the end, the chips holding on to the part behind the end mill. This is the spring pass and this gets rid of everything that's still sticking to the part. And we're left with a nice clean part. I have way thinner parts, like this 4mm piece, that also need a step machined all around. And same procedure here, I have a aluminum plate standing up in the vise, backing the part. And just for additional security, I'm clamping the part with um, vise grips against the aluminum plate, so it does not move to the side, which it could with the large overhang. And, and then it's just the same thing. I'm running it uh, climb milling to rough and then a spring pass to get rid of the uh, stuck on chips. And this works very well. Before that I, I clamped them down to the machine table and that was annoyingly slow. So here is a quick tip to align the tool of a shaper with the edge of a workpiece. Use a magnifier and a good light source. And when we look through the magnifier, we can see the tool up here and the workpiece down here. And when we move the table side to side, um, we can align the tool very precisely with the edge of the uh, workpiece. Um, that's pretty much the easiest way to align the tool on the shaper in a precise way, especially with a V tool like this one. So I have this Tapmatic um, 30 TCDC tapping head and it came with a more steeper 2 shank, but it has the tang on the end um, that you need on a drill press to get it out of the spindle with the drift. I use this exclusively in my milling machine and the milling machine of course has a draw bar and when you want to use a tool with a tang you have to pull out the draw bar and this is quite annoying. So I'm going to take the, the shank out of the uh, tapping head 
whack the end up with an abrasive disc and drill and tap it for a, I think, more simple to is a 10 millimeter thread, M10. So, in the past, I made these wedges to, um, to separate the B taper that goes into the tool. I made the, these for my larger uh, Albrecht chuck. These are just round discs that are tapered and have a slot milled into it. Two at a time, you just go on the shank like this. Doesn't fit for this one, of course. Like this, and then you just push them together. Yeah, this is horrible. You go on to the here like this, then you push them together in the vise, and they will separate the shank from the drill chuck. And this set of smaller wedges was for a, a very small Albrecht chuck, not this one or not this shank because it doesn't fit. Um, I make them on purpose. I just take these are made out of I think oh yeah 12379 that's a D2 tool steel and these are made out of a large diameter drill rod. Most of the time uh, mild steel would be good enough but usually I have some kind of tool steel lying around some cutoffs that are more suitable for this task as they are a bit a bit tougher. This time I'm using a piece of O2 tool steel and we're going to make a set of wedges for the tapmatic. This distance here is 11 millimeters so my material here is 8 millimeter thick so the wedges will look something like After I had a sketch, I prepared to stock some O2 tool steel on the bandsaw and I'm running a, a rather coarse blade which cuts quite fast. It's 4 to 6 TPI. Then I squared up the blocks, roughed out the slot and I laid out the, the tapered section just with a layout line. And to machine it I clamped the wedge or the to be wedge in the vise with a with an old gauge block in the in the slot so it doesn't collapse. Placing a scale on top of the vise and then I just aligned my layout line with the top edge of the rule with the scale. And then I just brought down the end mill until it barely touched the scale and everything was set up. That's quite a fast way to machine a not so precise angled surface. Just laid out, use a reference edge to align it with the vise and then machine it down. Just running a 10 millimeter carbide end mill dry that's perfectly fine. Okay, I machined the two wedges with the slot in it and I deburred everything so they don't uh, scratch up each other. I'm not going to harden them. If you want to use them on a regular basis, it makes sense to harden them and draw them back to a good working hardness of something like 50 Rockwell C. But in this case, I'm probably only going to remove this taper once. Um, this will be good enough. And as you can see, the way I designed the wedges is so uh, they overlap about two thirds of the of the angled surface, and one third is free on each side. And now we can just go over to the wise, bench wise, 
pinch the two wedges together and separate the two parts that way. Most of the time it works. I put a little bit of um, lubrication on the sliding surface here. Some um, molybdenum disulfide. Just to give us a fighting chance. And now we put the two wedges in place. Like this. Go between the jaws of the Ys. And crank her down. And eventually it's a good idea to hold the part that you want to separate otherwise it uh, <laughs> uh, goes south. And as you can see one of the two wedges has uh, spread open a little bit. That's because of the radius up here in the taper shank the radius was pushing out on the two sides of the wedge. A clever person would have put a large chamfer on the inside here so the wedge, the flat surface, rests against this shoulder here. But I didn't. <laughs> but I was not clever in this case. But we got what we wanted and I'm not going to reuse this taper. Um, this one is pretty much pretty dinged up. Looks really not very nice. Um, I'm going to order a Morse Taper 2 to B12 taper with a drawbar thread already in it. There is no need to mess around with this. I had to do some preventive maintenance on my gut shaper. I pulled off the ram and I put a, a scraping pattern on the complete bearing surface of the ram using the Rens power scraper. And I did that because the original scraping, while it was completely intact, was very shallow. There was not much space for oil, so I used a 20 radius blade and I put a, a scraping pattern over the whole surface to break up the, the very dense surface. And then I, took, I even took a hand scraper and a hammer and I half moon flaked the lower surface to put even deeper oil pockets in it. You always want to put the the half moon flaking on the non-exposed part of the slideway otherwise as the half moon flaking is relatively deep um, you will pull dirt and dust into the slideway through the half moon flaking. Sometimes you see the half moon flaking on exposed parts of the ways and that's very bad practice. Don't do that. Here I'm working on the gibbs which form the other half of the dovetail. And I didn't half moon flake these, I just put a weave pattern with a 20 radius blade onto them to reduce the bearing surface. After I was done with the gibbs, um, I used a precision ground bench stone to remove all the burrs from the scraping and made sure everything was clean before I went on. The next part that I worked on was the ram itself. Um, as I said earlier, you don't want to put a half moon flaking on an exposed slideway, but you always can put on a, a normal scraping pattern, like a weave pattern. <clears throat> and I used some high spot blue spread out over the whole bearing surface to give me later an indication of where I scraped. Just spread it out by hand with a rag and then use the power scraper and put a, a even and neat pattern over the whole surface. And with the power scraper this whole job was done in uh, maybe one and a half hours. So the column, the gibbs and the ram. This, this makes really fast work. <laughs> I 
After everything was done, I put the gips back in place, cleaned out everything, put some oil onto the sliding surfaces and lifted in the ram. The nice thing about the gut shaper is all the parts are relatively light and I can move them by hand without a crane or a hoist. Getting the the lock screw for the swing arm back in place. And moving the ram back completely. Before the test run I use a pump oiler to properly lubricate the dovetail. There are oil channels in it which do a pretty good job of, of distributing the oil. And a test run showed me that the strain on the motor was greatly reduced, so that was very successful. I hope you enjoyed this um, rather short collection of random things. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.